So today I'm just going to talk about nutrition in, in children with chronic liver disease, and it's a and it applies to you, uh, children with uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin liver disease as well. Um, and some of the principles I'm going to discuss would also be uh, very applicable to adults with uh, liver disease as well, which uh, we don't very frequently see, frequently see uh, in individuals affected with alpha-1 antitrypsin. Um, and what I would like to actually discuss and present to you today is not more so like, you know, you should eat healthy, we all know that, you know, you shouldn't be overweight, you shouldn't drink so much, but more so some principles and ideas that you can take home and share it with your physicians and have some kind of discussion as to the validity of these thoughts and ideas uh, that may be applicable to your child or even to yourself, okay? So uh, some of it might sound a little bit strange and others might be a little bit more interesting, okay? So uh, I think I very important to have this slide. I've got nothing to disclose in terms of conflict of interest. I don't get any mo money from farmer or anybody else to say to promote their product during this um, uh, presentation. So the contents are really why is nutrition important? How do we uh, assess it? And what interventions are available? Very basic concepts, yeah. And I try not to make it too scientific because I get lost as well sometimes. Okay. So malnutrition in liver disease, in progressive liver disease, is universal, right? There is no way in somebody who has severe liver disease not to be malnourished. The question is, how do you identify it, and why is it there? Okay, there, it's, a multi, it's truly multifactorial. There's not just one reason why you're, you are not growing well or poorly malnourished with liver disease. Firstly, I mean, in the box on the right here, we have inadequate intake. And it's not just because you don't, the person doesn't want to eat. It's that the underlying liver disease actually gives you a terrible sensation of you know, anorexia. I don't feel well. I don't want to eat. You know, and they have a ch change in the taste, the palate in their mouth, where everything tastes bland. You know? What you really love to enjoy, the half-cooked, you know, not half-cooked, that's not the right word for it, you know, the medium-rare steak. You know, doesn't taste like a medium-rare steak anymore. It tastes like a piece of cardboard. And that's not because of the alpha-1 energy trips in liver disease. That's because your liver itself, in any liver disease, is sending out hormones and proteins that actually make you feel terrible and lose the taste palates in your mouth, okay? So uh, consequently, the, you don't enjoy your food anymore, and as a result, you don't feel like eating it anymore as well. And these proteins actually suppresses your appetite. These, proteins that's, these bad proteins released by your liver actually suppresses your appetite and make you feel that, so that you don't feel hungry anymore as well. Okay. The second component of liver disease that results in malnutrition is actually malabsorption. You know, your liver produces bile acids, which is very important for absorption of many nutrients, you know, specifically fat or fat-soluble vitamins. And when your liver doesn't work properly and you become jaundiced from it, um, you stop producing, you don't stop producing bile acids, you continue to produce bile acids, but it doesn't get excreted into your intestine where it works to help absorption of food, you know. It starts circulating, circulating in your bloodstream, which is of no use to anybody at all, right? So malabsorption is a major factor as well. And then, um, consequent to your liver disease, you actually have an increased energy expenditure. So say for example, what do I mean by that? Say for example, uh, for you to be able to do the things that you do every day, you require 2,000 calories. But about a third of adults, and nearly half of children with terrible liver disease, this is sort of moderate to severe liver disease, they actually have increased energy expenditure. So instead of using 2,000 calories a day to do all the things they used to do, they're using 2,500 calories now. So 500, extra, 500 calories extra per day to help them just to do the normal activities of life. Uh, combining that with you know, the increase in energy expenditure, combining with poor intake and malabsorption, you kind of start to realize why you start mal having malnutrition in uh, liver disease. Um, the fourth factor that's well recognized is actually mechanical factors that's associated with liver disease itself. I mean, this is a picture. This is really an extreme picture. It's in the picture of one of my patients. This is a little baby with not alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, liver disease, but another form of liver disease that has ended up in a need for liver transplantation. Consequently, uh, the child has had significant accumulation of fluid in the abdomen, cholecystes. And um, this accumulation of fluid, as you can see uh, here, has resulted in the very distended abdomen. 
this fluid again is of no use to anybody at all. You know, it just takes up space in the abdomen. As a result, your stomach, which can grow as it increases in size as you eat, has no space to expand anymore. So the moment you fill it up with 100 mils of liquid, you get the sensation of fullness and discomfort, right? Very similar with any, adult, any older child with the same problem as well with terrible ascites. They don't feel like eating because there's no more space in the abdomen to accommodate the food that you take in. So this is one mechanical factor that's also part of the reason you have malnutrition and liver disease. Over here in the corner, you have this little dotted circle, which I call metabolic dysregulation. Your liver is very, very important in storing things and processing the proteins and the fats that you have that becomes utilized by the rest of your body. For example, your brain, your muscles, you know, all those and building blocks for growth, for energy requirements are made or be processed by the liver. When your liver doesn't work properly, uh, these building blocks are either built slower or not being built at all. And as a result, you have malnutrition or poor growth. Okay. So, there it's, uh, so mal malnutrition in liver disease is multifactorial and it's almost universal when it comes to someone with end stage or severe liver disease. So why is nutrition important? And this is the, this is the only scientific um, uh, graph I'm gonna show in this whole talk today, all right? Um, and this is what we call a Kaplan-Meier survival graph, okay? On the left, you have the probability of survival. On the right is time from when the patients were included in the study, and as you go across to the right, sorry, across to the left, uh, it's time, the number of days they have lived since entry into the research study. And the groups, group one, group two, group three, group four, are basically subclassifications of patients with different severity of uh, malnutrition. Essentially what this graph sh uh, shows you is that, um, so patients with, in group one has the most severe malnutrition we have. And you can see over a period of say 700 days, which is almost two years, the vast, major vast majority of these patients with liver cirrhosis uh, has actually died. So you have uh, at about 700 days, 35 to 40 percent of patients with liver cirrhosis uh, and malnutrition have died. In comparison to patients in group four who have liver cirrhosis, uh, but good nutrition, and the majority of them, 95 percent of them, are still alive after two years. So nutrition has an impact in terms of long-term survival uh, for individuals with a significant liver disease like liver cirrhosis. So that is one major reason why nutrition is important. On other levels, nutrition is very important uh, in, is, uh, for recovery from surgery as well. Okay? If you go into an operation malnourished for whatever reason, you know, the chances of having complications from the operation itself doubles or triples. The chances of you actually leaving the hospital uh, alive okay, is also significantly reduced as well. So therefore, nutrition plays a very important part in our ability to heal our body as well. So how do we assess the nutritional status of a child? And some of this is very similar to also how you assess the nutritional status of an adult that walks through, our, to the, through the doctor's office. You know, a medical history, so just talking to the patient is very important. And what I mean by clinical phenotype here really is, what is the underlying problem of causing the liver disease? Because not all liver disease are the same. In alpha-1 antitrypsin, we call it a cholestatic liver disease. So the, they tend to have more problems with malabsorption of the food as the liver disease progresses. In comparison to someone, say for example, with hepatitis C, malabsorption is not so much an issue uh, right from the start. They tend to have more abnormalities with dysfunction of the liver. So the ability of the liver, the factory, to make products for the body. So that's very, very important uh, to delineate initially. Then we take a nutritional history, all right? So uh, you could sit down and ask the patient what you ate yesterday and what you, asked and what you ate the day before and so on. But recall history is a little bit biased because you want to make us, the physician, feel good that we're doing a nice job of you know, looking after you. So you tell us there tends to be a bias to us giving us a, reporting a better oral intake 
than it should be. Okay, so uh, a look back kind of his nutritional history is not so accurate. What we like to do uh, in our team is actually ask for a prospective, a forward-looking data collection system over a three-day period. And in this three-day period, we ask for two weekdays and one weekend. We eat differently during when we're working at the office, and we eat differently during the weekend. Is that correct? Right. Some of us have Sunday rolls and so forth. You know, whereas on a weekday, you might just have a sandwich for lunch compared to a, you know, a big lunch on a Sunday. So that's very important to take into account how we assess nutrition, okay, and the nutritional history. Taking a nutritional history would give us the quantity of food that you're taking in and also the quality. The quality of food you take is very important as well, you know. Um, you hear this all the time, you know, don't take junk food, don't drink too much pop, don't take too much alcohol. That's quality of food, that's what I'm talking about, okay? And quantity as well, obviously, you know, if you need so many calories per day and you're only taking X amount, either you're taking too much or too, or too, much or too little, that also can impact on your nutritional status as well. Finally, in, the, in terms of talking to your patient, a psychosocial history is very important, particularly for the patients, I believe. For example, parental beliefs, I mean, for whatever reason, this family does not eat chicken. What I, I have no idea why this family eats, doesn't eat chicken, but if I do not ask about it, I would have lost a source of protein that's vital to the normal growth and development of my child, of my patient, okay? So it's a very important to actually try to establish what kind of living environment the person or the child uh, lives in to help establish the kind of food or the food practices at home that may influence the nutritional status. Uh, the other thing, uh, the really important thing about the psychosocial history is not the psycho part, but the social part. Can they actually <coughs> afford to buy quality food? Can the family actually afford to have three meals on the table every day? Not everybody is as lucky as we are. You know, some families just get by you know, with one decent meal a day. You know, the kids go hungry in school, and as a result, they may be mal more, even more at risk of being malnourished from just the simple fact that there is poverty in, in the household. Okay? And in those situations, having a team with a social worker that could actually help find food stamps and so forth is going to be very, very useful and important. Okay. Now let's get down to the nitty-gritty bit of what we do with our hands and so forth. So the physical examination is a really important part of our day-to-day -day work. Um, the eyeball test, you walk into the doctor's office and he goes, oh, I haven't seen you for six months, Jim, and you've put on a lot of weight. Or I haven't seen you for six months, Jim, you've lost quite a bit of weight. What's, what's happening there? You know, And that's usually a, not an unreasonable test. But the eyeball test is one of those where, you know, when, you, when there's a dramatic change, you can pick it up. Whereas Minutia changes are difficult uh, to pick up, all right? So that's why we have more complicated uh, methods to actually help establish the nutritional status of an individual. For a child, we routinely measure height and weight, and for the younger infants, we tend to do head circumference as well. Down here on the right, you can see what we call a growth chart, and this is a growth chart for a child between 2 to 20 years of age. Uh, where's my little mousey thing here? Right. Uh, at this is weight. This is height, and as down here is age. So as you grow older, we expect your weight to go up along one of, following one of these percentile lines. So if you haven't seen this before, this is what we use routinely every day in our office. And the black dot is an example of what we would, where we would plot the child when they come to clinic and say, well, look, you're growing absolutely fine. Your weight is on the just above the 50th percentile, so well, about 50% of the, uh, of the uh, Caucasian population, right? A much more dramatic way to look at this is that instead of a one static uh, input point, you have multiple static input points, multiple input points over a number of period, uh, over a period of time in terms of years or months, right? And in this situation, I've made it fairly dramatic. The child was on the 50th percentile at uh, five and a half years of age, but hasn't grown. There's been no weight gain over the next few years. As a result, you know, uh, you can see that the weight remains fairly similar across, but as you grow older, so you, we, call, we call this fairly described. You're following off the growth curve, okay? So a static input point is very important. 
but follow-up is even more important to help us try to determine what is the whether there's been adequate growth over the next few months, two years in the child. We also use other uh, formulas to help derive uh, from our physical examination in terms of growth as well. Many of you might have heard called something called the body mass index or the BMI. Okay? It's basically weight divided by height meter squared. It's used very frequently in adults to try to determine malnutrition. Ideal body weight for an adult is between the 18 to 25 BMIs. Right? Anything more than that, you consider overweight or obese. Anything less than 18 means that you're malnourished or you're at risk of having malnutrition. Okay? In kids, the BMI, again, is very much like this. It's a changes with time as you grow. Because a, a two-month-old infant or a six year old child, if they have a BMI of say 18, they're actually overweight for their age. Because it's not compatible, it's not uh, transferable to an adult BMI. Okay. Right, and there are other ratios as well, such as the ponderal index, weight to height ratio, different things that we can use to help us establish the nutritional status of the child. A little bit more complicated is what we call skin fold thickness. We have little calipers, and we can measure the thickness of your skin. Right, for example, your arm, for here, your mid-arm is made of a layer of muscle, a layer of fat, and then bone. By using calipers and method, 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 mathematical models, we can actually determine how much muscle you have, how much fat you have. And there are standardized curves to actually tell us that you are actually, you're actually malnourished or you're adequately nourished based on your muscle mass. And we can follow those to tell you over time whether, you are, whether the child is growing adequately or you're losing weight. Muscle mass is very important uh, because it is actually a predictor of survival uh, with liver disease. So we can use simple measures like a little caliper and a calculator to tell us in five minutes uh, where we are in terms of risk from liver disease and malnutrition. There are other things that we can do in office, things like uh, sticking a needle in your arm, drawing some blood and sending it off to Dyna Life, and we usually get these results back within the day. Routine uh, lab measurements that uh, reflect nutritional status are things like albumin and pre-albumin, which are proteins made by your liver. Okay, transferrin and retinol binding protein as well are also proteins made by your liver. These are very good markers of nutritional status and health in an individual. But the caveat behind this is that as you can, if you can remember, I just said they are markers made by your liver. So in the context of the failing liver, the liver might not be making this anymore. So be, to be using it as the gold standard sometimes, you might be falsely assuming that someone is too malnourished because your liver is no, lo no longer making it anymore. You're saying, well, you're malnourished because your albumin is so low. That's, and that's probably not a true reflection. So you need to remember that it can be used, uh, but with a word of caution. The other things that we routinely measure are things what we call micronutrients. You know, you know, the vitamins, fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, K, which are absorbed in the intestine and uh, made utilized by the rest of your body. Zinc, magnesium, all those are very important in health. Wound healing, bone growth, all those are, uh, need micronutrients as well besides, uh, besides the other proteins that we have. Now, the more fancier things that we do as part of our group, but not necessarily easily available to anybody else in the community, uh, these sort of non-routine laboratory investigations. Okay. If you come, if you end up in my practice, in my service, um, you might find that your child will end up having one of these tests done as a supplement to confirm our clinical suspicion and to also help guide us as well. So the first thing that we do is something called body composition analysis. And this is an example of a body composition machine. And this is a pea pot. It's designed for babies. There's the bot pot, which is designed for adults, which you can actually sit inside. In the pea pot, we actually uh, insert the baby, believe it or not, insert the baby into this little capsule here. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, it, it opens up. You don't put it through the round blue thing here. <laughs> okay. This lid here actually opens up and we place the baby inside. Okay. And the principle behind it is air plethysmography, really. And it can tell us how much fat, how much muscle, how much uh, uh, bone uh, an individu individual will, uh, will have. And based on what we get and norms, we can actually tell you whether you have too much fat, not enough muscle, and this is what we should do in terms of intervention, 
or you know you don't have enough fat, you don't have enough muscle, and we need to do X to try to do it. An evolving concept that your doctor may know is something called uh, sarcopenia. Uh, sarcopenia means uh, a poor muscle mass. Okay, and as, as I had mentioned, muscle mass is very important in terms of recovery from any illnesses, and is also a predictor of uh, poor outcomes as well. So. Uh, this machine here can actually help us define muscle mass, so sarcopenia. The other thing that we do is actually manage en measure energy requirements. How much energy does it take you to stay alive a day? Okay. Um, we use fancy machines like indirect calorimetry. Uh, we get you to lie down, put a hood over your head, measure the amount of oxygen that's being consumed and the amount of carbon dioxide that's being produced by you. So breathing in and out, just very simple, breathing in and out based on the principles of, you know, you use oxygen and you excrete carbon dioxide as part of burning of calories, we can then calculate how much energy your resting energy expenditure is. So resting energy expenditure means how much energy you use just to stay alive, just lying on the bed, not doing anything else. And then we can add factors on top of that to calculate what your total energy requirement is per day and supplement you specifically to that target to ensure that you have adequate nutrition. Okay. The less fancy way of doing it is actually using mathematical formulas. For example, down here you have the WHO male formula where you go 11.3 times weight in kilograms plus 16 times height in uh, meters plus 901. Okay. So we know the formulas are not as accurate as physical measurements, but in a quick, dirty, sort of five-minute consultation with your physician, there's something he could do as well to help figure out what the problem is. Okay, if there's a problem, not what the problem is. Okay. And finally, we have now actually moved away from, in terms of our practice as well, uh, from just measuring how much fat, muscle, bone you have. We actually would like to really like to know what is your functional ability uh, to perform things every day based on your physical uh, stature. So what, this is what we call functional assessment, a six minute walk test. So we have this little lab set up in our gym in the hospital and we walk the patient for six minutes and see how far you can walk. Of course there will be limitations. If you have respiratory problems with multiple one any trypsin, you might not be able to walk as far as someone who doesn't have lung problems, okay? But again, it's a functional assessment. It tells us what your lung capacity is, right? And someone who's malnourished, you know, with lung problems, the six minute walk test will tell us what your functional capacity of both your nutritional status is and your lung problem, your, your lung disease as well. Okay. Second thing here is for those of us who are, who go to the gym, it's called a dynamo dynamometry. This little machine on the right, on the left here is basically how strong is your hand grip. Okay. We know that hand grip strength is proportional to uh, muscle mass and that will also reflect in terms of uh, the probability of uh, complications and outcomes with uh, your liver disease or any other disease that you have. Okay, It's an easy test to do and it's validated to be used in children who can follow instruction. So a five-year-old can actually, if you, if you can hang on to dynamometry, we have normative values for them to tell us uh, if it's within the normal range. And finally, this thing called assessment of frailty, you know, it's, it's a combination of all these things put together. The six-minute walk test, the dynamometry, your skin fold thickness, we put it all together, we plug in through a calculator, and it tells, gives us a number. It gives an overall picture of your nutritional status and your functional status as well. You know, and it helps us make some decisions uh, in terms of the, the care of your child or the adult. So having done all that, we now know where we stand when you come to clinic, the things then that what can we offer, okay? And these are, this is just a little bit beyond the Canada Food Guide, you know, because uh, the Canada Food Guide would be you have to eat so many portions per day, so much dairy, so much meat, so much fiber, so much grain. Okay, this is just new insights into how to manage liver diseases uh, and malnutrition. The important principles that we go by, and it's been validated in, in, in many, many scientific studies over the last 20 years, is that one, to identify the patient early and intervene early. Okay. The fact that you're walking around, not jaundice, no pain, looking pretty well, doesn't necessarily mean that you're not losing muscle mass, okay? So all the things I've described before will help us identify individuals early for early intervention. Second thing is when you have liver disease, 
you know, particularly if it's sort of mild bordering on moderate liver disease, you shouldn't be fasting, okay? You should have regular meals and small snacks in between to ensure that, you know, every three to four hours that you have some calories in, okay? And the biggest fasting period we have in a day in an otherwise healthy individual is actually overnight when you go to sleep, you know? You sleep for eight hours, but you have nothing to eat for that period of time. And, in, and interventions, having a snack before bedtime, has actually shown to improve nutritional status in individuals with uh, liver disease, right? Uh, same for kids as well. We practice that as well for our children. And finally, finally, if you really do need nutrition, tube feeding is one of the most effective way of actually f providing nutrition on top of what you're eating right now. Sounds horrible, but it's a, I guess, a necessary evil in some situations. And, un and unfortunately for us as well, for myself, we do it all the time as well. Right. Other tips, stratify your interventions by disease severity. So not everybody needs the same sort of interventions that we can provide, okay? We know malnutrition is a poor prognostic indicator for individuals with liver disease, whether it's alpha-1 antitrypsin or anything else. But what we also know now is that obesity is actually bad for your liver as well. The most common cause of chronic liver disease in North America, including Canada, is something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, all right? And non-alcoholic fatty disease is 99% associated with obesity, right? And we know from studies in kids that if the child has, for example, as a, uh, hepatitis C and obese, the probability of rapid disease progression is significantly higher compared to a normal weight child with hepatitis C. So therefore, the principles would similarly apply to alpha-1 antitrypsin as well. I'm not saying it applied by inference. I'm saying apply because we know there's been already one study in, ch in ch kids that shows that uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin is a genetic modifier for non-alcoholic non fatty liver disease. So conversely, it's also true as well, okay? The second point here is children are different from adults, okay? Um, and sorry, I'm a pediatrician, so I always tell you children are different from adults, okay? All right, and from a nutrition point of view, why are they different? Well. Growth, okay? A child is always growing all the time until they finish puberty, okay? So when we provide calories to a child, we don't only provide the minimum amount of calories of keeping you alive, plus factoring in your activity levels, and then the thermic effect of food. Just to eat, to digest food, you actually spend energy to digest food, okay? So in an, in an adult, it's that, those three together give you total energy expenditure a day. In a child, you go that plus the growth factor, which is at another 10 to 20 percent uh, on top of that as well. All right? So very important to remember that when you're looking after children. And finally, macro and micronutrients are also very, very important in our diet. Uh, here comes where the quality of the food that you eat is also very important. All right? And I'll dwell, I'll dwell in, into it, that a little bit more in the next uh, two or three slides. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm coming to the end. I, I'd like to talk a lot. Um, so finally, uh, what interventions? The most important thing is actually provide enough calories, okay? Make sure that if you're malnourished, you get the enough calories to actually meet your energy requirements in the day. And we can provide that in, in three different ways, you know, carbohydrates, fat, protein, okay? Uh, carbohydrates, things like sugar, we can provide carbohydrates in many different ways. Simple carbohydrates like glucose, fructose, so those are single building blocks that your body can absorb very easily. But in, for someone who has issues with low glucose, low sugar all the time, you don't want to provide them with a big hit of sugar because what you have is a massive rush that happens in 30 to 40 minutes and then it disappears completely after your meal. meal and then you have your lows again. What you want to then in that situation provide is complex carbohydrates, something that your body digests slowly and has a slow release over a few hours. Right, so that's important to remember as well. Um, in liver disease, because of malabsorption, you absorb fat poorly. And probably the one that you absorb the least as well, okay, because of the lack of bile acids in the intestine. Uh, to circumvent that, we use something called MCT oil, medium chain triglyceride oil. Right. MCT oil can be absorbed into your body without the usual mechanisms and digestion process that we have in our intestine. So 
uh, we tend to give our children extra MCT oil or provide them with formulas that have extra MCT oil uh, in exchange for what we call LCT or, or very long chain fatty acid, which is uh, the, the ones that you require um, uh, the extra digestive effort. Uh, not to forget essential fatty acids. There are two essential fatty acids in our body that we cannot produce. So we need to ensure that whatever fat we supplement, it provides the essential fatty acids as well. Otherwise, there will be retardation of growth, skin problems, developmental problems as well. Right? And these are, like, uh, these are essentials. And finally, uh, evolving concept, fish oil. I'm sure everybody here has heard about fish oil and how it's become really popular. Fish oil is omega-3 fatty acids, and it actually gets converted to either DHA or EPA. And DHA and EPA are what we call less inflammatory uh, proteins in our body to help control and, and reduce um, unnecessary damage uh, as a result of inflammation. Uh, when you provide high MCT oil input, you, don't, you might actually lose out on some of these omega-3 fatty acids. There is no standard way of supplementing it at the moment or standard dose. What we do is we give uh, long-chain poofers or DHA EPAs in doses as recommended by Health Canada. And finally, we also ensure that we provide enough protein in your diet. So protein, red meat, chicken, fish, all those very, very important. In the old days, if you have terrible liver disease, your doctors used to cut back the protein to say that you are at risk of having uh, cerebral irritation from high protein intake called hepatic encephalopathy. That idea now is out the door. Why? Because pro muscle is the main, second largest organ in your body that actually breaks down the toxins in your body that your liver cannot take care of. And muscle feeds off protein. If you don't have enough muscle in your body to feed off, the, to take away these toxins, then you're gonna have issues with even more severe encephalopathy later on, okay? Brown's chain amino acid is a formula that we are fiddling around with and there's been a lot of experience around the world. I mean, the very early studies on would suggest that it's very specific to muscle growth in children. We have a research study going right now that actually targets this in our children, um, and we believe that it actually helps, you know, uh, muscle growth in a situation where we have severe malnutrition from liver disease. Okay. So that's still in works, but there's actually good scientific evidence in adults and in children from the la in the last 20 years to suggest that it's a good thing to have. What we're trying to do is to say it is definitely a good thing to have, not suggest. And finally, micronutrients, very, very important. Do not forget this. It's important to look after them. It's important to know that you have adequate levels. And most of this you can actually uh, test. Your family physician or your doctor looking after you can actually test for. Iron is good. Iron is important for many things. Iron is important in children for development. Iron is important for the ability of your white cells to fight infection. Iron is important for making hemoglobin, the red stuff that make the blood red, okay? Right. If you don't have enough hemoglobin floating around, you don't transport enough oxygen. If you have lung problems, that's an issue. Isn't that right? Okay. Zinc is important for healing. If you have zinc deficiency, you don't heal so well. So if you're going for an operation and you have zinc deficient, there might be more issues with that. Selenium is good for antioxidants. Calcium, magnesium is good for bone. Fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, all very important in its own different ways. D is good for bones. A is good for eyes. You know. Deficient, long-term deficiency, deficiency of these can result in problems. And many of them, like A, D, and E, is very easy to measure in our blood, okay? Vitamin K is a little bit more complex because there isn't a very good blood test for it. What we use is a surrogate marker that perhaps is not as good, it's not as good as we'd like it to be because once you start having abnormalities of this surrogate marker, you're probably 99% deficient of vitamin K, so that's too late. And finally, sodium, salt in your diet. You know, the, late, the, the thing from Health Canada is cut back the amount of salt in your diet, which is true for most people. If you have hypertension, if you have other issues with your cardiovascular system, but if you have liver disease in, in childhood, cutting back the sodium may actually result in poor, poor growth. We've had kids where we've had to manage their ascites, the excess water in the abdomen with lots of diuretics. Diuretics makes you pee out the salt in your body and consequently, they don't grow. So it's important not to exclude salt in the diet in the child uh, with liver disease. All right. So that's my 15 minutes, I think, or more than that. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you much, very much for listening. You're a much better audience than my wife. Okay, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>